Well, uh, welcome to Lecture 17 in Topology. Uh, I thought I was going to skip this section, but I uh, apparently assigned some homework from it, so <laughs> I guess I better cover it, huh? Anyway, so here we go. Um, an exhaustion by compact sets of a topological space X um, is a sequence of compact subspaces, K sub n, and taken from the natural numbers, such that the nth um, member of this sequence is a subset of the interior of the n plus one-th one, and the union of all the, all the uh, sets, the compact subspaces in the sequence, it forms the whole topological space, all right? So, um, if you were just to use the open, uh, the interiors of each of these compact sets, then that would give you an open cover of X, all right? So, in other words, that, that tells us also that for any compact subset, um, of x, well, then that means we can, if if, um, if that's a compact set, right, and you take this open cover, if you have an open cover of the whole space, then it's, of course, an open cover in a silly way. It's an open cover of any subspace, and as such, if the subspace is compact, then there exists a finite subcover, and so that implies that there exists, like, a, a maximal n, which um, nests all the other ones in, right? So... In other words, H has to be contained in the in interior of um, the nth one, and um, like that. Now, um, you can definitely get the interior of a sufficiently large K to um, contain H because, um, you know, if, if, if for whatever reason um, that was not, if that was somehow like not containing um, well, anyway, let me just stop talking about that. It's obvious you can do that. So, all right. So, example one. Um, in my in my circles here, uh, rather my um, really these should be disks. My disks are not to scale, right? Because here you've got kn such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to n squared. So, like the first one of these is the disk of radius one. Then you've got the disk of radius. Oh, I guess it is disk of radius two. Oh, he has, does have. He doesn't have n here. He's got the square here. So actually, I'm not wrong. This would be, maybe this is one, then two, then three. Right? N equals one, two, three, perhaps. Um, yeah, I was. I was thinking that. Um, I was thinking of n there, and, and thinking though well, the circles wouldn't be evenly spaced. But since he put an n squared here, that that does make the radius of the disk to be uh, to be n. So you've got these uh, concentric disks centered about the origin of radius n, and uh, yeah. And of course, if you take the union over all n, you just keep going out and out and out, and of course you get the whole the whole plane, right? And um, why are they compact? Well, they're closed and bounded, right? So a closed bounded subset of Euclidean space is compact. That's that's something we know, right? Okay, so um, all right. So following example one, let me scooch this up a bit here. So following example one. We seek to show that if we take a point away um, from R2, if we, this so-called punctured plane, Y would be the punctured plane. We remove the origin. Uh, we want to show that the plane and the punctured plane are not are not homeomorphic. All right, so this is the argument given in, in Minetti. Um, let's see here, where are we in Minetti at the moment? V R in the very end of the chapter four, right in here exhaustions by compact sets. So this argument is essentially on uh, page 83. Anyway, move along here. So um, so suppose there is a contradiction that there exists a homeomorphism that is a smooth by, uh, excuse me, a continuous bijection with continuous inverse from the plane to the punctured plane. And um, okay, well then of course we have an exhaustion of um, you know of the plane, and we can map that exhaustion um, through this homeomorphism to the punctured plane, right? And so we could define dn to be the image of kn, and um, because f is a homeomorphism, it maps compact to compact, and so dn is compact, right? And um, of course it covers everything, so you've got, and it's got the right nesting because um, that, you know, the um, the nesting property that we want of the original exhaustion, it, it's going to be transferred through by the homeomorphism as well. I guess I haven't written that all out in detail, but you can check on that. 
So anyway, dn is an exhaustion of the, the puncture plane by compact sets. And um, notice that, uh, let's see here, so he's like, and then he, he does something rather like, what? But let's just track it. And um, he uses f for this part of the argument, but I don't think that his f down here is the same as the f he had before, uh, I don't think. Because um, here we have an arbitrary homeomorphism, but then he's like, let, uh, let f be equal to x squared plus y squared. So he's like picking a specific formula after he said it was an arbitrary homeomorphism. So I don't think it's the same f in the proof. So I just changed the letter to make it more clear um, from Minetti. Um, anyway, so observe the unit circle is compact. And um, so there exists a uh, n in the exhaustion such that it's a subset of dn, right? And um, if I let g be the mapping that's the distance from the origin squared map, right? So x squared plus y squared. Well, that's continuous, right? Um, from the punctured plane to zero to infinity, and which that means it's got a max and it's got a min, right? With um, and the min, uh, let's see here, m with zero. Okay, so let's see here. And now the context, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. On dn, that's the, um, sorry guys. Let me just look at the rest of the argument. Maybe I can come to terms with it. Can you see it? see it right all right um, all right so we've got this let you know we've got this exhaustion um, we, 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 we use the homeomorphism to transport the exhaustion to the puncture plane right and then what so he's like well look at the circle it's a compact subset of the plane, which means that, let's see here, what does that mean? Well, of course, it's also, I mean, it's also a compact subset of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, punctured plane. Um, so I think that's kind of what's, I, I think the fact that it's a subset of the punctured plane is more relevant, but because then I get that it's it's contained in dn for something in the uh, uh, where dn is the image, you know, of kn. All right, fine. Let g from the puncture have this formula: the max m greater than one and minimum little m on the compact set dn. Now, how do I know that the minimum M has to be between zero and one. Um, well, I guess I know that because if G is going from Y, right, to there, then the smallest that that value could be would be zero, but that's not allowed because we're taking it from the puncture plane, right, which is not got zero, zero. So G is, is, is manifestly not zero. Um, so if it has a minimum, it's got to be positive. Um, why would the minimum have to be less than one though? Um, well, is that because S1 is a subset of DN? I guess that could be it. Um, Well, I'm sorry guys, I'm just not seeing why that would be right off the top of my head. It's probably something really obvious again, but I'm just not tracking that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, it took this directly from Minetti. I'm trying to make sense of it. It, it made more sense when I wrote it down yesterday, but... Anyway, so he's got these two sets. I called them A and B. And the one would be um, the points in the puncture plane less than the minimum and the points in the puncture plane greater than the minimum, all right? And 
arguing that that has to be a subset of the puncture plane with dn. Um, so dn is the exhaustion which, contain, which contains the unit circle. Um, This is, this is contains the inner circle. Oh, okay, so if it contains the unit circle, that means it has to contain the n equals to one case, I suppose, which is why we get the minimum has to be less than one. Um, I guess it's that. All right, anyway, so in any event here, we've got points that are in Y complement by DN, points in Y complement DN, either um, inside or outside of the, um, the unit circle. And if I call that A and B, I notice that um, y minus dn is equal to a union b. Let's see here. How do I know that x squared plus y squared equals to 1 is not an element of dn exactly? I thought I did have that. Man, uh, I'm sorry, guys. <clears throat> Let's see here. So, ignoring the part I'm confused about, we have that yn minus dn is the union of a and b. Where a and b, I mean, it's clear enough that a and b are, are not are intersecting; uh, they don't meet, you know. And it's also clear enough that they're open. Um, so, but on the other hand, if we look at y minus dn, it's f of this, um, it's, you know, it's f of r2 minus kn by just properties of functions and sets, um, images of sets and complements and such. Thus, y minus dn is connected because um, we know what kn is, right? So r2 minus kn is is r2 with i mean kn is just the disk of radius n basically and so if you take the disk and you delete it um, from r2 it's still a connected set right but we've just on the other so we have on the one hand it's manifestly the image of a connected set which means it's a continuous image of connected it's connected and yet this right up here above if you can you know not <laughs> not gets not get sucked into my confusion Whatever, whatever it is I'm confused about up here. Um, if you don't buy into my confusion, if you just if you can see this argument for proving that there's a separation of y complement by dn, then that proves y minus dn is dis is not connected, and yet it's connected, which is of course a contradiction. Um, and so that contradiction, where did it come from? It came from assuming that there's a homeomorphism from the plane to the punctured plane. So. Sorry, there's there's something I'm not tracking in terms of the logic with the construction of the, the, the G function. I mean, he writes F in the book. I know he, I don't think he means F there. I don't think he means it's the same function before because you can't assume that the homeomorphism has the this particular formula. I mean, it's just, you have to, dis the, when you do a contradiction like this, you can't say, Oh look, here's a particular formula which doesn't work. Like you got to disprove it for an arbitrary homeomorphism um, from your between your allegedly uh, non-homeomorphic spaces, you know. Um, so there's that. I, I think that's okay. I think I'm right about changing the letter. I, and um, you know, it's definitely true that the circle's compact, and by the what's discussed up here, surely yeah, there has to be an n such that you know, the circle's contained in dn, and okay, well, fine, and then, you know, we can define g from the punctured plane by this formula, that's fine, and it is true that it it's positive, its outputs are positive, right? 
And um, it's also true that if you have the continuous, continuous image of a compact set, then it must be, um, it, it must attain its extreme values, right? The extreme value theorem says that there exists a, you know, a little, a little m and a big M, um, which are attained, right? There has to be actually a point or points in dn, which give you, you know, g of those points is equal to m, g of those points is equal to big M. Um, so, um, yeah, and I mean, since, since n is a natural number and dn is the disk well, what is dn? I guess I don't, that's the thing is, I don't know what, dn is the image of the, of the disk, right? So I guess I don't know. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I don't know exactly how that is around, is containing s1. I just know that there exists a, there exists a n such that that happens. Um, and I understand why little m has to be bigger than one. I don't know if I really understand why little m has to be less than 1. Um, I mean, that says that the... So I guess these are in the domain... I'm sorry, guys. There's just something I'm missing here. I don't know what it is exactly. I don't understand that one. Man. Well, anyway, I'll let you guys say in the comments. The show must go on, I'm afraid. So, page two here. So, anyway, that, that is, of course, an um, important thing to remember, which is that the if we, take a, if we take a topological space, right, and we remove a point from it, then it, um, you know, typically um, changes the topology, which is a little bit surprising, right? I mean, given the flexibility we have of so much with, you know, donuts becoming coffee cups and stuff, it seems like, it seems kind of counter, <laughs> counter, counterfactual or whatever. Like, we can change a coffee cup into a donut, topologically speaking, but you can't take a plane and remove a single point. <laughs> like, it's kind of twisted, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, so the characteristics of a space at infinity is captured by the one-point compactification of the space. Um, it's also called the Alexandrov. I think I'm saying that right. Oh, goodness gracious. I don't... I, I honestly, folks, it's that time of the semester. So it is, yeah, the Alexandrov comp... Yeah, Alexandrov compactification. So, um... So a topological space paired with the point at infinity defines x hat so that's x union infinity. Of course, we're assuming that infinity is not a point in the space as it's given. And then you define the topology on x hat, which is, again is the compactification of the space um, as, well, there's two kinds of open sets. You've got open sets which were already open in x, right? And then there's also the open sets that are formed from taking the, the whole space and removing a closed and compact set in x. So I would call these the neighborhoods of infinity, all right? And theorem, x hat with the topology above is in fact a, uh, a compact space, all right? So why is that true? Proof, well, begin by noting that um, the topology given above does define a topology on x hat. And in fact, if you look at the inclusion map, that's an open immersion. Um, which is not really saying much. I mean, so the the inverse image of a open set in X hat, you know, um, either you get um, something that's empty, like over here you get empty because something in here contains the, um, necessarily contains infinity, right? So the inverse image, you can't, you don't map to infinity with the inclusion map. So the inverse image of all these guys is empty and then the inverse image of any of these open sets is just the open set again. So yeah, it's an open immersion. Lovely. It is not immediately obvious that this uh, is, is a topology, but you can check 
um, you know, arbitrary unions and uh, finite intersections of these things are again things of the same type. And of course it's got the whole space and it's got the empty set, so yeah, it is a topology. But anyway, um, so let's do the interesting part. Why is this one point, why is x hat compact though, all right? So suppose you have an open cover of x hat and let infinity be in u naught without loss of generality since it's got to be somewhere, right? And so I'm just going to say it's in the 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 the, the u sub naught one. Okay, I'm going to call that the one. It's got to be in at least one u, uh, at least one u which contains um, the infinity. You know. So um, it's an open cover since u naught is open in x hat. We know that u naught is the complement of x hat by some closed compact set k, right? And but we also know that if we look at the union of i not equal to zero that covers, let's say, j, which would be equal to x hat minus u naught, right? Because if you just look at everything except for u naught, well, that's certainly going to be, since this, since the, you know, the totality of the u's covers x hat, if I just remove u naught, then certainly it covers j, which is x hat minus u naught. But what is that? Well, that's x hat minus x hat minus k, but then by properties of complements, that's just k again, which is to say that this covers this this right here covers j, which is in fact just k, but remember k is compact. Aha! Uh -huh. So that means that there exists a finite subcover of this guy, u1 through yn for k. And so if you take those and you pair them with u0, then you've got a cover for everything in x hat. And so there you go, that's a finite subcover of the open cover, and thus x hat is compact. As we just showed for an arbitrary open cover, we've got a finite subcover. So that's pretty snazzy. And um, I think the place that um, students tend to see this, well, I mean, I don't know, at least my students would tend to see this would be the complex analysis course. So in the complex analysis course, we like to talk about, you know, extending the complex plane to infinity. And um, when you do that, you look at neighborhoods of infinity, how are they formed? Well, they're their outer annuli, right? And what is that? Well, you're you're taking the complex plane and you're complementing it by a closed disk. That's exactly the general construction up there, right? That and that is exactly the you know the Alexandrov construction. So that that's that's that. So here are some here are some open sets in um, you know infinity union complex numbers, the outer outer annulus. And the interesting thing, I suppose, is that you know it's not just the topology that transfers over to this discussion, right? There are certain um, functions, right, that extend naturally to include mappings of infinity, like the uh, the fractional linear transformations, rational functions, things like that, right? The, so the discussion of you know so-called meromorphic functions and and such, it's very interesting. Um, but anyway, back to the topology here. So that's an example. Now. Next up here, proposition, x hat, the uh, compactification is Hausdorff, if and only if x is Hausdorff, and every point in x has a compact neighborhood. So I will remark, Manetti's argument is more efficient, you see page 84 if you like, but I um, found a way to make it take a page, so here we go. <laughs> um, so let x hat be the compactification, where infinity, of course, is not an x, and we're going to give it the topology that we talk, that we defined in page 2. All right. So the converse direction. Suppose x is Hausdorff and every point has a compact neighborhood. Let x and y be elements of the compactification and, and consider possible cases, right? So of course we suppose x is not equal to y because we're trying to show that they can be separated by open sets, which then proves that x, is, x hat is Hausdorff. All right, so if x and y are both in x, well, then since x is assumed to be Hausdorff, there exists open u and v in x. But if they're open in x, they're open in x hat. And conse consequently, we've separated x and y, all right? So there's that case. Case number two. If x is an element of x and y is equal to infinity, then there exists a compact set containing x. And... Um, Moreover, the interior of that compact set contains x, but we know that 
it's compact and closed, right? So therefore, um, see, because the reason I know that x is not equal to y, right, which means that x has to be in the complement. Um, how can I say this? Uh, well, I'm, I'm using, I'm, excuse me, I'm using the assumption, right? Every point in x has a compact neighborhood, so there's my compact neighborhood, right? Um, but this is open since we've got a compact subset of a Hausdorff space, which implies it's closed, right? Remember that? House, compact and Hausdorff implies closed. All right, thus infinity is an element of this. Um, and x is an element of um, k0. K zero. But this and that are both open in the topology so defined, which means, again, we've separated the point x from the point in infinity with these two guys. So, um, I mean, I can draw a picture of this. What, what's going on is, like, you can think about this is, so, like, this is the, um, the outer annulus, and this is, like, the interior to the outer annulus. And they they don't they don't meet they they get awful close but they don't actually touch right um, but anyway um, there's that ah uh, let's see here three sorry I'm tired today guys I don't know what uh, let's see here so three if x is equal to infinity and y is an element of x then by symmetry we can do the same argument too right. I agree. So that's the that's their converse direction. Now the forward direction. Suppose x hat is Hausdorff. Let x and y be an x with x not equal to y. I'm trying to prove then for x hat Hausdorff, I want to prove that um, that implies x is Hausdorff and that every point in x is a compact neighborhood. So, all right, here we go. x, y, and x with x not equal to y, then that means x and y are also an x hat, right? Which means there exist open u and v in x hat such that x and y are separated by these open sets which don't meet. And um, so if u is, right, if u is equal to x hat minus k for some closed uh, k and x, then what does that mean? That means that u tilde formed by x intersect x hat minus k, well, that's going to be an open set because um, it's the intersection of a, um, an open set. With, with x, right? So, um, so that's open, and x is an element of u tilde, but v tilde. Um, let's see, what was my v tilde? Did I ever say? It follows that. I think I'm using v tilde to mean the same thing, like. Um, ah. Hmm. Yeah, so I think my thought was to make V tilde, construct V tilde in the same way as that. Um, let's see here. All right, so u tilde is a subset of u, right? u tilde is a subset of u because u is x minus k, and we're intersecting x with x, mi x hat minus k to form u tilde. So u is a subset of u tilde. And in, if we construct v tilde in the same way, right, um, then... Um, like by that same K even, I guess. I don't know if he's the same K, I shouldn't say that. Um, you know, sometimes things make sense when you, you, when you write them down, but then when you come back to them, it's like, what was I thinking? That's why you should always write down all the details, you know? Um, anyway.
do 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 do. So construct v tilde in the same way, then that means v tilde is a subset of v, all right? And um, it's also open in x, um, mimicking the construction of u tilde. And um, all right, let me think about this for a second here. I'm trying to prove that x is um, Hausdorff right now, right? And I, I get open sets in x tilde. I get open sets, excuse me, I get open sets in the compactification which separate x and y. But I need to take those open sets and somehow cull them down to open sets in x which separate x and y. But I, I think I can just do what I'm saying here, which is to intersect, basically, those open sets in x hat with x. And, yeah, yeah. So we can just, I mean, let me uncomplicate things here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that k thing here momentarily, but forget about the k for just a second. Just think of u tilde as u intersect x. And think of v tilde as v intersect x. Then that gives you um, a pair of open sets in x which separate x and y. And that proves that x is Hausdorff, right? But it remains to sh explain why every point in x has a compact neighborhood. But I think that this k is going to do it for us because, um, let's see here. If x is in x, then since x is not equal to infinity, x in x hat is Hausdorff. We know that there exists u and v open with x and u and infinity in v. And v is equal to x minus that compact set for some k. So, like, I think up here, I, would, I don't know why. I mean, like, up here I was talking about k closed. I don't think I needed to do that. Like, there's a simpler, I mean, there's definitely a simpler way to do all this. I think we could just, just take the intersection of u with x to get your u tilde and, like, don't do this k thing up here, right? Okay? Um, sorry about that. Um... All right, so anyway, uh, coming back to the, the issue of the compact neighborhood, um, we have x hat Hausdorff. Uh, all right, so there exists the open u and v. And since v is open and it's a neighborhood of infinity, that means it's the complement of x hat by a com some closed compact set. And um, consequently, that means that x has to be an element of k. All right, x has to be an element of that k then, and um, that means then that x has a compact neighborhood, so it's just that. But anyway, uh, this is all of about two lines in MedEdy, so I don't know why I'm blathering on so much about it, but there it is. Finally, proposition, let f from x to y be an open immersion of Hausdorff spaces, and then let g from y to the compactification of x be defined by g of y is equal to x if y equals f of x, and infinity if y is not an element of the range. All right, so this is, g is kind of like an inverse, um, sort of. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Not exactly, but anyway, this is continuous. In particular, a compact Hausdorff space Y coincides with the one-point compactification of the uh, punctured Y for any Y. Oh, that's kind of neat, right? So if you take a space and you take a point away from it, if you want to get back to that space topologically, you can just take the one-point compactification of it. So that's that's pretty neat. So the one-point compactification, it's the um, sort of the inverse process of a puncturing. <laughs> it's cool. So here is the proof. This is from Minetti, page 84. Let u be open in x and um, x in the compactification, if u is a subset of x, well then g inverse of u is just f of u. 
And as f is open, we know then that g inverse of u, which is f of u, is open, right? Um, and then, if we suppose that u is, is equal to the other kind of um, open set in the compactification, it's the complement of x hat by a compact closed set in x, and as such, the inverse image of u um, is equal to y minus f of k. Um, so that's just the definition of the g up here, basically, at action. But um, So we have that. Can you see the other? I guess you can see everything at once. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to scooch back down. Sorry, guys. Um, so we have g inverse of u is y minus the image of, of k under f. And that's open. Why is that open? Because corollary 5.2 gives the, that f is a closed map. If we, so if we restrict f um, to a compact um, set k, then um, f of k closed implies that, um, well, anyway, if, if, we can, if, we restrict, if we restrict f to a compact set, then um, that means that the correlated 5.2, 4.52 gives us that f is a closed map. Uh, we will... You open that up for us just a second here. 4.52. Where was that? So f be continuous, x compact, and y Hausdorff, then f is closed. All right, so my claim is that that's our context if we're looking at um, um, f restricted. Let's see here. So um, first of all, f restricted to k still makes it the image. The image is still in y, right? And um, y is Hausdorff that's given. So we take f, we restrict it to the compact space. It's a mapping into a Hausdorff space, therefore it's a closed map. And if f is a closed map, then that means that um, k being closed, remember k is closed, means the image of a closed set under a closed map is closed. And if that's closed, that means that um, if that's closed, that means the complement of y by that space is open. But that's exactly what we need. We wanted this to be open. Uh, so in, in, all, in all cases, the inverse image of an open set is open under g, which proves that g is continuous. All right. And finally, if we suppose that y is compact and in Hausdorff, and we set y equals to, excuse me, set x equal to y uh, with a point deleted, and, and then f um, from x to y is the inclusion map, all right? Then the map g is continuous bijection uh, between compact Hausdorff spaces, which implies that g is a homeomorphism. Hmm. I guess, I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously we're using the... Uh, let's see here. So, so the inclusion map from the deleted, from the, the, the punctured y to y, that's, that's clearly um, injective, I suppose that's clear. And, but it, it wouldn't be onto, right? Hmm. G is can other than the map G. Oh, I see. So we trade. So it's a weird. It's a weird kind of thing. You're like extending the domain. You're extending the punctured domain by compactifying it. And in so doing, that makes G basically the inverse map of the extended F. That's what this is. And that and, and it's a it's a and this and we just proved it's continuous. F was assumed to be an open immersion, which makes it continuous. So then the Okay, so then F suitably extended becomes the homeomorphism 
from the compaction from the compact space to to the compactification of the deletion um, to y again, and then the inverse of that map is this g that we're talking about up here. Huh. Interesting. Hmm. Cool. All right. So anyway, at non at next time on to the um, what you call it there. Uh, do to do. Oh yes, quotient, quotient topologies. So it's not it's not too late to topologize. We'll see it. We'll see it. Thanks, guys.